This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. If you're enjoying the show or if it's helped you in any way, please consider rating and reviewing. We especially like fives if we deserve them. Your input is extremely important for spreading the news and getting the algorithms to love us as much as I know you do. Today, Catherine Stoner from Stanford University will tell us what we need to understand about the history of Russia and the history of Ukraine in order to understand the terrible conflict that's ongoing now. It's the future of Russia. Before we get started, a quick reminder to rate and review the Future of Everything podcast on whatever app you're following it in. There's a terrible conflict happening between Russia and Ukraine, and it's created turmoil in that region and globally. Hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost, and there's been economic, political, and cultural implications of this conflict. Well, in order to understand this conflict, you need to understand the perspective of the Russians and Vladimir Putin on Ukraine. You have to understand the Ukrainian perspective on their own history, and you need to understand the role that these two countries play in the world and the impacts they have on places like the United States of America. Well, Catherine Stoner is a senior fellow at the Spogli Freeman Institute for International Studies, and she's the director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. She's an expert on Russia, and she's an expert on the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. She'll help us understand the roots of this conflict, and in the end, give us some hope for how this may end well for everybody involved. Catherine, thanks for being here. You're an expert in Russian affairs. How should we understand the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine in the context of Russian history and politics? So that's a that's a big opening question, Russ, but okay. Um, (laughs) I'll take a hit at that. Um, How you understand the history kind of depends on on uh, whose side you're on. So Um, On the one hand, if we look at uh, Vladimir Putin's um, perspective, and he's now been president or prime minister of Russia, but anyway, in charge for the last 24 years, and and he's got another 12 to go, potentially. Um, uh, Ukraine, from his perspective, and he wrote this um, historical missive a few years ago, two or three years ago, um, basically explaining the the unity of the Ukrainian and Russian people. And so he sees them as a single community um, that um, was originally united. He goes back all the way um, to Kievan Rus uh, and, um, and the 10th century, or the first century, uh, pardon me, 10th century, and um, the, the taking on of uh, Russian Orthodox religion um, by Prince Vladimir. And he sees this as, as the founding uh, of Russia and um, Kievan Rus obviously starts in in Kiev, um, and so he then takes Russian history from there. So let's remember he's not a professional historian, right, um, right. but um, he thinks he is, right? And and this and, is a convenient narrative for him, obviously. Absolutely, absolutely, and he draws on history and. Uh, um, and so, you know, Ukraine is kind of sacred Russian imperial territory. Um, now, from the Ukrainian perspective, they, they pick up the story. That, that any way you argue it, they say, look, well, we're an independent country. And you could almost think of it um, like the United States and Great Britain um, in some oh. ways, right? Um, Putin says that, look, um, religiously, we're the same. Um, it was a historical accident that we gave um, uh, Ukraine away. Um, that you know uh, that was the fault of Vladimir Putin and, and the communists. I mean Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Lenin, and the communists. Yes. And my Biden moment there. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> wow, um, it, it's an artificial construct. Uh, the language is the same. Blah blah blah. Um, the Ukrainians say, look, this is a little bit like, you know, uh, the United States and its revolution against, uh, the empire. Um, either way you slice it, even if you go back to 989 as, as he does, um, and, uh, and Kievan Rus, it's Kievan Rus, right? So there was a Kiev before there was a, as a Russia. Um, but in 1991, December, the Soviet Union breaks up and we have 15 independent countries and, one of them, sorry, drop my headphone here. One of them is uh, is Ukraine, and another one is Russia, and they are independent and different. Um, and I could keep going, but uh, but uh, Putin's predecessor as president of, of Russia, 
uh, Boris Yeltsin um, signed a document acknowledging that, you know, they, this was an independent country and several other documents that uh, later that in exchange for nuclear weapons, Russia would respect Ukrainian territory and, and Ukrainian borders. Um, and so those are pretty wow. different perspectives, right? Ukraine, no matter how you slice it, we're our own place. And just because we speak a language that's similar, but not the same as Russian, doesn't mean we want to be governed by Russia again. And Putin and many people in Russia see it completely the opposite. So, so given that they have this entrenched different, let, let, let's now take the United States perspective. And there's a strategic aspect to this. And I know this is one of the things you study very closely. So putting that aside, and maybe we have opinions about that, we being, you know, as if we're all a single voice, maybe the United States has an opinion on that argument. But there's also strategic and lots of other implications of this of this conflict for the United States. So kind of the same question, how do we look at this and to the extent that we are a we? Right. Uh, yeah. There's how we did and how we do. Yeah. Um, right. And so and so, well, so um, the U.S. Um, signed um, an agreement with uh, France and with Russia and Ukraine and um, Belarus and Kazakhstan um, in 1994, um, the, the um, Budapest Memorandum that um, was uh, all about basically moving um, heritage nuclear or legacy nuclear weapons from those four former republics uh, or three former republics of the Soviet Union into the fourth Russia so that Russia would take over um, uh, nuclear weapons. And so we were particularly concerned about that uh, coming out of the Cold War at that time. And so that was an agreement we also signed. And we said in return for this, we will provide security um, for Ukraine. Okay. Um, now, we didn't say we guarantee uh, NATO. That came later uh, under George uh, W. Bush um, at a NATO meeting in 2004. Um, but uh, we did, you know, I think a lot of people forget, and Putin conveniently doesn't, doesn't ever mention this, um, that his predecessor signed this agreement. So, you, you know, our perspective is that Ukraine, just like the other... 14 former republics of the Soviet Union are independent states um, until their people decide otherwise. And um, there was a referendum in December of 1991, and it was resoundingly in favor of Ukraine becoming a uh, an independent country. So our perspective is um, there are rules in the international system governed by international law. And because uh, there are not mechanisms like, you know, that are that are in terms of enforcing them, um, other than us all having a moral responsibility to do so or war, right? Um, and um, so we not only feel we have this responsibility because we signed this security um, guarantee, um, but we also, or security assurance, I shouldn't say guarantee, because it was kind of weak, to be honest. Um, we also view it as this is uh, an aggressive war that was unprovoked, um, on Ukraine, um, Russia attacked a peaceful country. Um, and the reasons for that were, be we think, uh, are because Mr. Putin saw um, the possibility of Ukraine becoming a democracy and also joining the European Union. So not so much NATO, but the European Union, and therefore pulling Ukraine away um, from sort of Russian hegemony yes. in that region. So and, the, the, and, and I and I believe you you've written about and talked about how is is this a test case? Is this something that we should we United States should be very careful about? Because as you've said now a couple of times, there's 13 other uh, former Soviet uh, republics and they right. are at perhaps a similar risk. And how real is that risk? And how do you assess that? Because then then we're starting then not. Uh, those are people my age start thinking about similar arguments that were made about Southeast Asia in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and mm -hmm. 70s. Uh, and we, we went, we know that that didn't go very well. So, and I don't want to bring that in kind of spuriously, and I'm not a historian, but tell me about this domino effect, kind of the obvious, kind of maybe overly simplistic domino effect argument. Yeah. So, I mean, the, so the argument would be, and I think there are um, some reasonable, uh, data points that would would affirm this argument um, would be that, uh, as you mentioned, so 15 f 
former republics right. that made up the Soviet Union. Russia and, and Ukraine are two, and then there are 13 more. Um, the Baltic um, states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, they have joined the European Union. Um, they have also joined NATO. Um, Russia has given up on them, basically, for the most part, right? Although, you know, they may interfere from time to time. And in, in the, one of my books, I, I, I talk about this a fair amount. Um, Russia has a lot of different levers uh, of control over all of these other 14 republics, in, including Ukraine. So the two, I'd say, that are, or three, that are most at risk, and one could argue if you're in Kazakhstan, four, um, are Georgia, um, which is in the in the sort of South Caucasus region above Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, uh, Moldova, which is to the west of uh, Ukraine, um, also kind of a struggling quasi-democracy liberalizing, and then Belarus. Um, now, Kazakhstan has a huge border um, in Central Asia um, with Russia. It has a huge Russian population, um, but... Um, there's an important difference, I think, between Kazakhstan and, let's say, Ukraine or Georgia or Moldova, um, and that is that um, it has an authoritarian government. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a softer form of authoritarianism than Russia has become, but it is, uh, it is maybe more of a fellow traveler, its leadership um, and, and governing system closer to Russia's, and so therefore less of a, a threat. They also have China. Um, sitting there as well. So different kind of dynamic than with the, the republics that are, are more to the west right. of Russia's borders. So the, the worry in Georgia, for example, this little weak country that very few of us probably think about, um, except here in Palo Alto, you know that we have a, a Georgian restaurant. Yes. Um, there's another one, that, another branch of that restaurant in Los Altos. Um, uh, Georgia is a really fascinating country. I've been there a bunch of times. Um, and it had been uh, democratizing, liberalizing, really gunning to join the EU and NATO. And now they've had a change of government. And that government just recently tried to and actually succeeded in introducing a law um, that was very similar to one of the first laws Putin introduced to crack down on civil society and NGOs. So um, uh, some of these places are valuable to Russia because there are pipelines that run through them. And so Georgia right. has, uh, has that pipeline issue. Um, but also, again, you know, this is an issue of falling out of Russia's orbit, potentially, and providing an example to Russians who may be not so happy with Mr. Putin um, it, uh, of, a, of a different way of governing. And um, and so that's also, we think, one of the biggest threats that, that he sees. It, they had one of these color revolutions, as did Ukraine, that is the Georgians did. Um, so this is a political risk for him. Yeah. So, so you said that Georgia was kind of pretty gung ho about democracy. And, and, and it seems like demo having democratic values is kind of a prerequisite for NATO and, and EU. But mm -hmm. how and I know you've written about this. This is one of your expertise areas. How democracy ready are these countries? And I, I say that very naively, not even knowing what that means. But, um, you know, I, I've, we've all heard things about the nature of these democracies. They're nascent. Democracy is hard. I think we're living that right now. <laughs> so anybody who thought it was easy was wrong. Um, uh, and um, and, how, and how, how should we think about those democratic movements under extreme pressure uh, and with these neighbors, this big neighbor, who has big time problems with democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, but although I know you also study whatever the internal Russian in, uh, interests and instincts for democracy are. So maybe a little primer on democracy in that part of the world. Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, you are right, Russ. Democracy is really hard um, and it's problematic. And um, but it's the, you know, uh, it's the worst of all systems, except for all the alternatives. Right. And so there are there are is a generation that is over over 50 basically in um, that all of the former republics of the Soviet Union that lived under something even worse, right. which was communism. Um, and they lived under communism falling apart, which was also particularly difficult and in, in different places, varying degrees of market reform, which was very painful, right? Because the Soviet system was um, you know, if you like a small state, it's it wouldn't have been the place for you because the state decided everything. And it's actually a really 
sort of fun to describe this to um, Stanford undergraduates who have no idea who Gorbachev was oh. or, you know, or Brezhnev or any of these uh, sort of blast from the past names that you might remember. I have home videos of Gorbachev from his visit to Stanford, which I, ch oh, yeah, which yeah, I cherish. Right. Yes, but that's a whole yeah, different. That's right. Yeah, that's right. They have kind of a, a different perspective and a conflation even of democracy and market reform. Uh, and so if you ever want to descend in this podcast or another time <laughs> into the sort of public opinion details and is there legitimate support for Putin within Russia, we can do that. But the short answer is, yeah, there is actually. Um, so. So for many of these countries, the experience of democracy or liberalization, because none of them ever, except for the Baltics, really get to be consolidated democracies, including Russia, although they do have some competitive elections in the 1990s. Um, others just in Central Asia, with the, with the slight exception of Kyrgyzstan, there's just really no effort. Um, but Ukraine is and Georgia were a little different um, in terms of their experiences. And one of the big differences between them in Russia or even um, Belarus, but but I would say Russian uh, in particular, is that they have very active civil societies. So, um, you know, Russia, we do see people take to the streets and we have seen people take to the streets en masse. And we certainly saw that in the late 1980s as the Soviet Union was falling apart. And we saw it in the 90s. We even saw it in, in um, 2020. Um, when uh, in, in 2021, um, before the war, when Alexei Navalny, for example, returned, um, and then even even after the uh, in, initial invasion in 2022 in February, we saw some demonstrations. But that's the end mm -hmm. in in Russia, and yeah. that's largely because um, Putin has just really cracked down his regime. But in Ukraine, we saw, as I mentioned, this color revolution, um, and we also see one in Georgia. Uh, in the early 2000s, and that is people taking to the streets over elections that they felt were corrupt, um, and in fact were corrupt, and overturning the result, and and um, sort of deepening their democracy. Um, they have all had problems with corruption, you know, uh, um, and and basically stealing from the state, and because um, uh, that's where a lot of the corruption comes from. Georgia, for a while, did well attacking petty corruption. Um, Ukraine has done well. Um, it, it, I think, gets a very bad reputation um, for corruption, and certainly that was true before this Euromaidan, um, uh, which was the sort of second Georgian, uh, uh, pardon me, Ukrainian uh, revolution in in 2014, um, and uh, and Putin responds to that by seizing Crimea mm -hmm. and then starting a low boil war in uh, in eastern Ukraine and and. Um, and so that's really, I think, what has caused um, this is that is it, this conflict is that, um, as we said at the beginning, um, you know, there is a difference in in historical opinion about um, Ukraine and Russia. Um, and there is, you know, I think a fundamental difference in within Ukrainian society uh, of where um, most Ukrainians would like uh, the future of Ukraine. And that is in Europe Got and NATO. Um, and uh, Putin concerned that there is a demonstration effect in that. This is the future of everything with Russ Altman. More with Catherine Stoner next. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, and I'm speaking with Catherine Stoner from Stanford University. In the last segment, Catherine gave us a great groundwork of the history of Russia, a little bit of the history of the Ukraine, how they think about their relationship with one another, and how this war serves the interests of Vladimir Putin and some Russians. In the next segment, she'll tell us why this war has not gone the way the Russians expected, or really the way anybody expected, with the possible exception of the Ukrainians. She'll also give us hope for how this might go in the end, and why there are still reasons to think that there will be a better future for Russia. So, Catherine, in the last segment, you gave us a really good set of background, the history, going even back to like 1000, uh, 1000 AD. Fast forwarding, this war has not gone the way I think anybody expected, maybe the Ukrainians, but I think many here in America, certainly the Russians with their, with their reputation for a huge, well-run army. This We're now you know well past a year um, or two. At what... 
what happened and, and, and how should we understand why this war has not been a big success for Russia? Yeah, so we're we're past two years, as you mentioned. Um, well, so basically we're at a stalemate. There there are some incremental changes um, along the um, south southeastern border, uh, re, you know, moving the moving the line of conflict um, even a, a little further west. Um, I think the big surprise here for for Putin is, and uh, certainly you know we can we can relate um, when we think about our own experience with the Iraq War under the Bush administration. Um, is that um, Ukrainians didn't want to be liberated um, from uh, what he what he tried to describe to them as you know an illegitimate regime? Um, they um, they didn't want Russian tanks coming in. They didn't want to be part of, right. of Russia, and I, and so I think he had some bad intelligence. Um, that is, the Russian military had bad intelligence. Putin himself had bad intelligence. Um, I think this is uh, can be a problem with autocracies. Heck, I, I used the example of the um, of the Iraq War because, of course, that was a problem in a, in a democracy in that case as well. You might remember we were, yeah. uh, you know, assured that uh, the Iraqis would be throwing rose petals, I think, at American yeah. tanks as they as they entered. And, and in fact, that was not the case, <laughs> as it turned out. And um, Putin was evidently assured of the same thing. And, and in fact, Russ, they were so certain, um, the Russian military, that they were going to get this all over with in a week that um, dress uniforms were discovered in the tanks um, wow. that were approaching Kiev um, in preparation for yeah, the parades and celebrations that, that were um, supposed to ensue. So, so that was a major, um, major failure of, uh, of, of intelligence. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so in, instead, the, of course, the Ukrainians mounted an incredibly spirited grassroots defense, I guess. Yeah, even without having all of the weaponry that we've now given them and and um, our European partners have, have given them, um, they were able to to do that. And, and so I think that brings us to the second reason it hasn't gone so well. Um, you'll remember in 2014, um, Russia seized Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula yes. and still occupies yes. that. Um, well, they did that pretty easily. Um, there was limited bloodshed. Um, but since then, um, the Ukrainian military retrained. Um, and so Russia saw some of that in um, Donetsk and Luhansk, those eastern provinces of Ukraine where a low boil war continued between 2014 and, and the reinvasion in 2022. And the Ukrainian military in those eight years was getting training from outside, more money was put into it, and they got better. Um, so I think that was the second major failure um, in intelligence um, with with Putin, assuming that what they were going to face was what they faced in 2014. And it, and it wasn't. It was a professionalized Ukrainian military. The thing that shocks so many of us is that Putin has not been held to this by the, it doesn't appear that Russian mm -hmm. public opinion has turned on him with the deaths of all of these Russian troops. My understanding mm -hmm. is that during the Afghanistan, during the Russian Afghanistan kind of debacle, um, there was a ton of domestic unhappiness uh, and that mm -hmm. this contributed to lots of things. Um, what, what, what is going on and why aren't the Russians um, furious about this and why aren't they holding it against Putin? Well, so some some are furious, um, uh, but not the majority. Um, but uh, yeah, so just to give you some context, right, in terms of Afghanistan, we didn't exactly see people out in the streets protesting, right? right? right. Um, we, we, we just saw people kind of tuning out um, of politics and not, and not believing in the Soviet system. And frankly, they just couldn't afford to keep going in Afghanistan, right? And so, so Gorbachev gets them out of that in 1989 after 10 years there. What's happened here is in fact, even more men have died in this conflict in just over two years in Ukraine than in Afghanistan and all of the Soviet Union's post- I did not know that. Uh, yes, post-Cold War, I mean, post-war yeah. uh, conflicts. So all of them combined already in Ukraine, more Russian troops have, have died. Um, I, I saw yesterday a, a statistic, which I, I'm not I, I, I will throw up, but tell you that it's not completely confirmed that roughly 2% of Russian men aged 20 to 50 
um, have either been killed or severely wounded uh, in Ukraine since the start of the war. Um, there is a study by Medusa, uh, and uh, which is um, this behind me is uh, is from them. Medusa, which is a uh, um, an internet um, newspaper, and Media Zone uh, with the BBC that estimates um, at least 120,000 dead uh, Russians. Um, but it may be as high as 140,000 and somewhere around that's dead and 350,000 in total counting dead and yeah. those so badly injured that they cannot go back to war. So this is this is huge, this right? Is really huge. So why aren't more people upset about this? Well, first of all, we, we think about two million have left the country um, completely, um, either because they had to, well, or they wanted to. Um, then that's one. So, so some of the people you might see out on the streets or openly protesting may have, in fact, left. Second, since the beginning of the war, Russia's autocracy has gotten even harder. Yeah. So if, Russ, you were on the Moscow metro and you are just sitting there minding your own business but happen to be wearing a yellow scarf, you uh, would likely be reported by someone on that train um, to the police, and that's a, a significant fine of you know five thousand rubles, which may be about half your monthly salary. Um, and um, you know, depending on who you happen to encounter, it could also be jail time. So Russian jails is uh, um, a friend of mine whose husband happens to still be in jail. Said uh, in, to me in November. When I asked this exact question to her, um, as the wife of, uh, of uh, Karo Musa, who's still in jail and ill, unfortunately, um, she said, you know, Russian jails are really awful. Um, and that is is a disincentive to protest. You don't know what's going to happen to you right. um, if you end up in, in jail there, because this is not a country that has rule of law, as we see with Evan Gershkovich, um, who's uh, the Wall Street Journal reporter, yes. who's yeah, uh, being used as a political tool there. Um, so that's another thing. Um, and then even, you know, if you do things um, like, um, for example, there's a there's a case of a woman who um, was putting messages on price tags um, about how many people were dying in Ukraine in, in uh, Moscow. She's been, you know, arrested um, and, you know, she's gone to jail. Um, she had a kid. Um, but, you know, students will lose their places in universities. Um, you can lose your job. I mean, the knock on effects are long. And then ultimately, um, you can be sent to the front. Right. Which is the uh, worst. Which is, yeah. Which is kind of an old Soviet era tactic, yeah. by the way. Right. Is what's your worst nightmare? It's worse than jail. You're going to go fight um, for a regime you don't believe in and a war you don't believe in. Um, so what is interesting, though, is and, and it's very dangerous, obviously, to answer, you know, there's a lot of what we call preference falsification in surveys. Right. So if someone comes to your door and says in, in you're in, again, imaginary Russ in Moscow, yeah. hey, um, I'm you know, I'm a stranger. I'm either calling you or coming to your door and saying, do you support President Putin? Now, in the current environment, knowing what I just told you about right. the scarf on the that's train, an easy one, that's life? an easy one. What's your, what are you going to say? Yeah, Russ? I'm a, yes, sir. Go, Putin. go Putin. <laughs> I sure, right. I sure do. Um, but so if you but if you look at um, asking that question less directly um, and so we have some things called list experiments where, you know, we have a list of names um, of former Russian or Soviet leaders um, without Putin. And then we add Putin to the list. You, you can see you subtract one from right, the other right. and you can see that, OK, maybe it's not as much. Also, if you ask people about happiness, general happiness and their own well-being, it's much lower. Um, if you um, ask them, and, and there's an, another organization called um, Russian uh, Field, um, has asked, if you could go back in time and, uh, and not start this war, um, would you? And we're getting increasingly close to 50% saying they wouldn't yes. have started it um, to do it all again. So, so let me let me in the last minute. Let me just ask: Is there a, is there an is there a source of hope for for Russia, for Russians, and and even for non Russians like Ukrainians and Americans who are watching all this? Is there a reason to be optimistic? In the end, I think there is. I mean, until this war ends and all wars end in a negotiation, um, you know, uh, we're going to be stuck probably with Putin. Um, he can stay in office. Um, he just was reelected re yeah. um, and, and until 2030 this term and then constitutionally 
he can stay until 2036. He'll be in his 80s at that point. Um, it's going to be problematic. However, autocracies tend to be a little fragile at the top. Um, and, um, you know, there, I think there's a limit to how much more time um, Russian business will go on this way. Um, right now, they're, they have short time horizons and opportunistically they're making some money. But I think the real hope for Russia, and, and this comes through even in the dangerous question of yeah. um, do you support the president, do you support the war, is really in people under 35 in, in Russia. And, um, and there we see the highest number of people, even in those circumstances, right, of, of uh, the consequences being really grave, um, indicating that, no, I don't. Um, and these are people, after all, if you're born after 2000, you've never known another president other than Putin, and you um, are the YouTube generation, you're the internet generation, Instagram, you know, they're about to cut off YouTube in Russia, they've cut off all, everything else. These are people who've studied abroad um, and who want opportunities, right? Um, and who were benefiting from Russia being integrated. So it's Putin's generation that's made their peace with being cut from the West and they are not isolated from the rest of the world. But the younger generation, isn't necessarily happy or contented with that. Um, and so I think that's the hopeful thing. Um, and uh, in the end, Russians are, are, are well-educated people. Yes. And you mentioned, I think, I think you said uh, 2, million, 2 million people have left the country. Uh, yeah. And do they want to go back? Some do, some, some don't. Um, you know, most people do. I'm, I should confess here, I was born in Canada and I, I came to this country when I, when I was 22. And, you know, even as easy a transition as that is, and my children are constantly making fun of my immigrant experience because it wasn't very hard, certainly compared to others. It's still, it's yes, not your country right. for a while, right? And so when you throw on top of that, as we well know, you have to speak another language, or if your country is a pariah, as Russia is in, in much of the West, it, it's even harder, I think. So, you know, most people... I think if they could, would want to go back to their own country. And I think that's definitely, definitely true uh, of a generation that's moved. It's also the smartest of Russians that have moved. And, and you know, that is our gain, um, as we've seen from, uh, you know, people like Sergey Brin and others who've, who've come and started wonderful companies here in the United States. Thanks to Catherine Stoner. That was the future of Russia. Thanks also to, for tuning into this episode. You know, we have more than 250 episodes in our archives, and they're all, I think, really good conversations, short and sweet, on a bunch of topics that you might find interesting. Please check them out. Also remember, if you're enjoying the show, please tell friends, colleagues, family, anybody about them. Word of mouth is a great way for us to spread the word about the podcast and to grow our audience, and therefore to continue and to grow the quality of the podcast. You can connect with me on X or Twitter at R.B. Altman, and you can connect with Stanford Engineering at Stanford E-N-G.